Uh, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed your recording uh, presentations and also the discussion with your commentators. Now, um, I have to say in advance, I'm not as familiar with embodied cognition theories as I would like to be, but um, from what you said and from the discussions here, I have the impression that regarding language, uh, discussing language, it seems that or I'm not sure whether your account allows for a proper distinction between uh, linguistic communication and non-linguistic communication. So while I am sympathetic to the view that there is a continuity between non-linguistic and linguistic communication, it seems that that distinction is collapsed in your account. So my question is, can you still distinguish proper linguistic communication from non-linguistic, or is that not even something you would wish to do? Because when you talk about gestures, for example, and pictures and symbols and colors, linguistic, that goes against the intuition. So I would like to ask how you think about that. Oh, okay. Hello. Hi, okay. I'll start. Thank you for the question. I'll say that I remember very vividly conversations in the Basque Country at a table with young Hannah trying to see if we could put a border around what we would call linguistic and what we wouldn't call linguistic. It seemed participatory sense making. It was one of our very early conversations. And I think rather than settle that we kind of moved away in a sense from, from the question. Um, but I'm familiar with the question also from my work in gesture scholarship and the efforts to make gestures by some theorists to have gestures be seen as linguistic and others saying, no, they're communicative, they're not linguistic, etc. Um, so I, I might default to a pregnant sort of response here that it depends on the purpose of your inquiry, why you need to make this distinction. But um, I can, on our view, I can imagine certainly cases where we might identify a communicative process having taken place that would not necessarily have all of the marks of, um, of, of a shared agency that we've identified as linguistic, right? We have this sort of special social agency that has all these pieces of the model um, swept up in it that we, that we identify as linguistic. At the same time, though, if it's a human interacting with a human, I mean, the ramifications of our ontology are that we live our bodies as linguistic bodies. So that's why it really comes down to, which would cast a very, very wide net. So it really comes down to what's the purpose of, of needing to identify and mark the distinction. Um, one interesting space is communication between humans and animals because we are, are offering full linguistic engagement to babies, but maybe not yet to animals. It's another question we often have to have to um, handle or tackle. So uh, that's my beginning thought. I don't know if this kind of wants to add anything to this. Well, I mean, I'm just to reaffirm what you just said a little bit. I mean, if, if all the stages of the model somehow can be argued to be present in some way, so when you are examining the next act of communication, we will have to argue less linguistic communication. But there may be ways in which we call interaction between, uh, especially animal species, that do not fulfill all the, all the, all the stages on the model. But they could probably, how do we go beyond the, the, the first couple of stages? And then we wouldn't call that linguistic, uh, in animal signaling. The problem is that what counts as communication or not is a big debate in biology. Uh, you know, my PhD thesis was partly about that, and it's, it's a whole literature that is very problematic. How do you define communication? But if you were to just simply say, well, it looks like this is a very obvious case of communication, you could still say it's not linguistic. Uh, if you don't see a way in which you can see that there are partial acts, uh, you know, the core, you know, and non-activity of partial acts, uh, dialogical structures, genres, uh, reported utterances, everything that we said in the model, we said it in order to see this is the thing that which is most what we call language. So if you don't see any of that, well, you can say in pragmatic spirit, like I like, said, so this is non-linguistic. Uh, may I just just to, to make sure that I understood you correctly, so you would basically say, well, since every human being is a linguistic body and every communicative attempt of a linguistic body is language, so also gestures and 
and everything a human, a linguistic body does in communication is linguistic communication. So there is not, no non-linguistic communication of a linguistic body. Did I get that right? I'm, I'm very comfortable saying the gestures are Regimented languages 
in uh, scientific context or uh, other context that I mentioned. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Um, I just have a, a quick thing to say, but maybe then I'm going to have other things to uh, add. But uh, uh, the first thing would be just a clarification of the last thing you said about the approach being anti-representational. We have to clarify what we mean by this. Maybe it wasn't clear, but we mean that we don't have internal representations in our heads that we have access to every time we need to figure out things or make, look up the meaning of word in our head. That's not what, what we assume on the contrary, we say that we don't do that. But, in fact, in the book, we spend a lot of time saying what is the origin of representations, and, and then I was talking about symbols and so on as emergent. And once we're talking about representation in that sense, there is no problem whatsoever when you're talking about representations. Representations like the one you just described, very regimented languages, there wouldn't be a problem. I'm not saying we have an account of this, but I said it wouldn't be a problem because it's contradictory with the, the ideas that we're proposing. It's simply that we, we maybe haven't tackled that, that particular problem. Although we do talk in the book about institutional languages. Languages uh, that come up with very, uh, very well defined sets of meanings and expectancies about how to understand those meanings, like the, all the signs that you see at an airport that you have to take very seriously, you have not to go beyond this point, and so on. All of that we, we talk, we only touch about because it's one of the many issues that would be interesting to keep developing. Uh, but I don't see any. any at the moment, I'm seeing any obstacle in trying to make a, a proposal there that would have to do with how we agree in using the soft language. We agree that we need to, to, have, to behave with respect to certain symbols in a more uh, refined way, where the, the symbol means this and nothing else. And so it would be an underlying agreement that then creates the regimented layer. That they would just because somebody who doesn't understand how, how airports function and doesn't read the language, or they, they probably would ignore the sign that says do not go beyond this point. So, regimented languages are only regimented provided there's this under, under, undercurrent of soft understanding. So, that, that would be my first thought, but it's just, uh, as I said, that, like uh, something to be developed. Yeah, uh, I, very similarly, I, I like the, I very much like the metaphors or the, the images of the bag of sand versus the brick. Um, of course, Dick Wolfstein did a lot with bricks and, 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 and his reflection on language, and there's a lot there, of course. I think that, like Ezekiel was saying, um, our really kind of unique ability to have incredibly specialized discourses is going to kind of bootstrap or piggyback on um, our the kind of, the line we focus more on in the book. However, we did actually spend a good amount of time reflecting on how, as adults, in your job, in your career, in your family situations, if you are a bilingual, multilingual speaker, you adopt commands of, of, of a wide variety of, of languages, if you want to call, call them as such. Um, and that's sort of a remarkable feat, and it would seem like, seems to tempt a pretty story where you've mastered and are storing all of these languages, but our, our picture would be much more of a, um, of a habitual kind of procedural picture that we are able to um, enact these micro-identities, these micro-linguistic identities in the appropriate micro-world and face them. It's one way of many using um, some of the remote language to account for it. So I mean, absolutely, I think it's a fascinating case that we can do right here.
happy with the result that we were able to achieve in these two days. Uh, I'd like to thank the three of you as well very, very much for all the